This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Hello, everyone. Welcome to NC Spin. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let me introduce you to our panel of experts. They include John Hood from the John Locke Foundation, former chairman of the State Board of Education, Phil Kirk, noted editor and writer, Cash Michaels, and Chris Fitzsimons from NC Policy Watch. Well, I'm Brad Crone, sitting in for Tom Campbell. He's at a church retreat this week. And we've got a great show for you, starting with a razor close race for the United States Senate, some sideshows providing and distractions in the general election, as well as stagnant incomes and how it impacts the middle class. Let's jump right in. It's down to the wire. After more than a year and $30 million in advertising, North Carolina's U.S. Senate race remains a toss-up four weeks out from the election. Political pundits are asking when or even if we'll see a breakout coming down to the wire. Question one to Phil Kirk, why has neither Hagan nor Tillis been able to break out and establish a dominant lead? I think there are a number of factors. Uh, one is North Carolina is a pretty evenly divided state uh, when it comes to political campaigns in, in many cases. Uh, second, the advertising, I believe, started much earlier and in heavier volume, and I think people are turned off by it, uh, but mu some people must be turned on or they wouldn't keep spending the money. But I think it's, I, th I don't think there'll be a breakout. Uh, I think it'll stay close to, to election day, and it's like every other election, but particularly in a non-presidential, it's going to depend on turnout. Tea Party, uh, liberals and the Democratic Party, they're going to be able to turn both groups out. Chris, will it come down to a particular issue, education or Obama, as we proceed through? Will there be any one thing that really pushes out the election? Well, I, the, the interesting thing will be to see if either campaign in these last few weeks comes up with a new issue or tries something new, uh, as we've seen in campaigns in the past. It looks like the last, I don't know, dozen polls maybe have had Senator Hagan up three, four, five points. She, uh, her main message is that Tom Tillis heard education. Tillis's main message is that she supports Obama and votes with him 96 percent of the time. We've seen a million ads, but those are the themes that we've seen over and over and over. And I agree with Phil a little bit. I think people, most people have already decided how they feel about those two subjects. So the question is, can Tillis find something in these last few weeks to sort of make up that difference? And how many votes a libertarian Sean how I guess, oh, uh, yeah. will get, uh, I think will play a big role in the final result. Uh, John, ground game, how important is it? We hear a lot about Kay Hagan's ground game. The Republicans, are they working on ground game too? They are. They say that they've got the best ground game they've ever had. They've invested a lot of resources in it, knowing that they hadn't been as effective. Even in North Carolina, where they won the presidential race in 2012, they still didn't get where they needed to get, and they know that, so they've been working on it. Um, obviously, you have to have the ground game. You really do have, still have swing voters even in a midterm election. And uh, the problem that Tillis is having is that it really has been framed so far. Hagan's much more uh, resourced campaign and independent expenditures have been able to frame this about state issues in the legislature. It was even a funny moment this past week where Senator Hagan was campaigning, I think it was in Statesville or somewhere, and she said, you know, we're going to throw Tom Tillis out of the Speaker to the House office, you know, as if she's running to replace him in the legislature. Uh, so I do think uh, Tillis is going to be trying to move back towards the federal issues. You saw some ads on national security, and I think the net race is also going to get more personal in October attacks on either candidate. You notice we haven't heard a lot yet of some of the things that happened during Tillis's speakership. There were a couple of staff members that misbehaved. I think some of that might show up towards the end. And I think some of this material about uh, Chip Hagan, Kay Hagan's husband, benefiting from the, the stimulus pack. I think that kind of stuff we're going to see as October wears on. Cash based votes critical for both sides. Uh, where's the African American community? Are we going to see record turnout? That's a good question. Uh, first of all, the, the name Obama is not on the ballot, so that answers the last part of your question. No, right. you're not, you're not going to see record turnout. But having said that, though, um, the Hagan campaign has a problem with her reaching out to her base, indeed African-American voters, sending them a signal that she needs their support. Uh, I think after the debate this week, uh, we are going to see somebody take a lead and hold on to that lead. And I think that someone may be Tillis. Uh, if, if Hagan does not indeed send that signal, if she does not perform well, and keep in mind that his his camp so far is doing a good job of taking her apart, asking the question, what has she done? If she can't answer that question and then return fire, I think he grabs a lead and keeps it going into election day. 
Do we look at a 1980 situation where Robert Morgan got beat by John East by 5,000 votes? How close is the margin going to be? I think it could be that close. I actually remember being on a college radio station after uh, AP declared the race for Robert Morgan. Everybody went home and got up in the next morning to find out John East was our senator. I think it could be as close or closer than any Senate race in the country. It's going to be a night to watch, clearly probably two and a half million votes and, and a really close election. I've got good news. You can get additional video content from our panel and from other leading opinion makers on our website, ncspin.com. So keep up throughout the week by visiting a website or see us on Facebook at NC Spin or at NC Spin Tweets. Ballots debate for the old North State. NC Spin will return after these messages. My name is Bernie Teal. Sunburst Farms has been in my family for over 35 years. Last year I had to do something I'd never done before. Destroy 10 acres of good squash. I wasn't able to find enough workers. The opportunity is there. American families are demanding locally grown vegetables and I want to provide that to them. So please tell Congress that we need immigration reform now. We had the same hopes and dreams as, as any parents. We knew that something was wrong with Samuel. When the doctors told us autism, my heart sank. We knew we had to give Samuel a chance. When I found out that the insurance companies were denying coverage for the therapy that Samuel needed, I couldn't believe it. That was, that was our struggle at first, is, is, is how are we going to pay for it? Tom Tillis understood those challenges and, and was a huge advocate for us. We're regular people, and Tom Tillis saw a need he fought for it. Tom Tillis uh, has taken the, the politics and big insurance to the side and tried to do the right thing for families in North Carolina. Daniel is sweet and bubbly. I never would have thought that he would be where he is right now. It's truly amazing. I'm thankful for each and every breath that he uses to call me mama. Tom Tillis clearly has shown that he'll fight for people like us. People like Samuel. Carolina Rising is responsible for the content of this advertising. We now return to NC Spin. Welcome back. The election sideshows or game changers. We mentioned at the start of the show that there are several notable distractions in this election cycle. Two sideshows that are getting most of the press and attention are the court case that could postpone the 2013 election law changes and the giant mailing from Americans for Prosperity that resulted in tons of complaints to the State Board of Elections. We want to talk to our panel about these issues. Question one to Cash Michaels. A three-judge panel met in Charlotte two weeks ago to hear arguments as to whether to halt provisions in the 2013 election laws. Judge Jim Wynn seemed to take center stage in this proceeding and at one point asked why the state of North Carolina didn't want people to vote. There have been many tweets and blog posts about that comment saying his conduct was out of line. What say you? Uh, not what I say, it's what the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals said this week, where they said that Jim Wynn had, has some points there, at least two points for sure. Number one, why can't people, as long as they're in the same county, vote at any precinct that they choose, as long as they cast a provisional ballot? They let that through. And then um, uh, number two, same-day registration. They said that should be allowed as well. So it was seen as a victory for the North Carolina NAACP and, and its coalition. As far as the um, um, uh, Americans for, uh, for Prosperity uh, um, bogus registration, uh, voter registration mailers, a complaint was filed by the state uh, Democratic Party. A lot of um, really crazy things, uh, sending it to, to dead people, sending it to people's cats and so forth. Um, you know, and, and for them saying, oh, gee, it was just an honest mistake. So, yeah, that, that certainly is a distraction, no question about it. But the Fourth Circuit uh, upheld uh, Jim Wynn this week saying, yeah, there are some problems here. Let's remove at least two of these barriers and let the elections proceed well, on November 4th. It's not so much the Fourth Circuit upheld Jen, uh, Judge Wynn, but Judge Wynn wrote the decision that you're talking about. Right. I mean, he, he did write the decision. He needed another vote, though. He, he did. He himself. got, he got two votes out of then. three. Uh, I think that the Supreme Court, and, and you know, we're discussing this uh, a little bit ahead of time, but I think the Supreme Court will probably intervene. I think that the justice that's assigned to the circuit is Justice Roberts. And I think that they'll probably end up reversing the Fourth Circuit decision. It's not really in line with the way the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled recently on these voting rights cases, but it's debatable. We'll see what happens. Uh, the well, AFP thing, uh, it's no strain, no one that's been around politics for any length of time 
is going to be surprised that there are mailers that go to the wrong places, go to dead people, go to fake fictitious names. This happens sometimes. The really egregious part of that was the in incorrect information on the mailer itself, which I understand was caused by the fact that the, the national organization was doing voter registration mailings in a number of states. And of course, in some states, you do send information to the Secretary of State's office, not in North Carolina. So obviously whoever was doing those mailings mixed up information intended for one state, put it in North Carolina. And then the biggest problem they had is they didn't immediately explain how it happened and apologize, which is basic crisis management. And, and I'm upset my dogs didn't get <laughs> I just think it was sloppy. I think it was sloppiness rather than even being planned. I'm not going to give them credit. But, uh, for but it. I they John, should have apologized. Right, I do think John has a point. That the head of the state chapter in North Carolina was unavailable and sent a curse uh, uh, or terse email message to reporters and wouldn't give an interview. Why not just come out and say, our national organization screwed up, we're sorry. Oh, well, well, he did. But, but, well, he, but he, he did get into time. the story. I mean, it was really the national organization well. that didn't. They should have done something from the national, since they're the ones that did the mailers. They should have explained that more. But, you know, I don't think that there'll be any. Uh, we have seen in the past real attempts at voter suppression through these fictitious sorts of mailings, like in the ballot security program and so forth. This doesn't look like that. This was much screwier than that. Well, let me ask you this. What happens if the Supreme Court doesn't step in on the Fourth Circuit? What impact will it have as we go into the election cycle? I think it has very little impact. And there's not a lot of evidence to suggest the provisional balloting thing is unlikely to statistically matter very much. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I think you should send people to the correct precinct because then they can vote in all the races for which they are eligible. And maybe you could have a rule that if someone shows up in the last half hour of an election, maybe then you have a provisional ballot opportunity. But the same day registration could have mattered if it had been in place earlier and people could have planned for it. That could have mattered more. Well, let me ask you this. Let's look at some of the legislative races. And, and are there trend lines out there as you look at the polling data, Chris, uh, impacting either party right now? There's a lot at stake, both for the Democrats and Republicans. How is it stacking up as we're going into the legislative races from a global perspective? Yeah, well, I, well, I think one of the keys the, uh, from a global perspective, I don't think there'll be dramatic shifts, but what's fascinating is Wake County in particular, uh, I think is where a lot of the activity will be. I think a lot of the uh, uh, several Democrats will win in the, in the Senate races. The county commission, I think, will switch over to Democrat. It's fascinating to watch this concentration sort of a Democratic activity. One Democrat explained to me, well, this is ground zero. Everybody here has lived with what the General Assembly is doing and don't like it. The further you get away from Raleigh, the less people know, even Democrats, all the things that they've done. And that may explain why Democrats in, in Wake County are so energized. Phil, does the Republican Party keep uh, veto-proof margins in both chambers? I think they're going to lose, lose a few seats in the Senate and the House. How many? I, I don't know. Uh, to, to Chris's uh, point about Wake County, I think both parties uh, have targeted uh, 50,000, 60,000 voters who normally don't vote in the off year, that vote in the uh, uh, presidential year, and are really targeting them. And I know that both parties are doing a lot of, candidates are doing a lot of old-fashioned campaigning of, of Saturday taking people and going door to door. and in different days of the week. I think I'm seeing more of that this time than I normally do in an off year. So I think there's a energy there that's a little contradictory with what's going on in the rest of the state. Cash, any one race that, that is drawing your attention as you watch the legislative battles? Uh, not really, and, and, and for some reason, I think the reason why is because the, the, the Senate race seems to be sucking up all the attention right. all over the place. In fact, I saw something, somebody wrote something the other day where they reminded us that Clay Aiken and Renee Elmers were running in, this, in, in the second congressional district. You hadn't really heard a whole lot about that race as well. So, so actually, no, no, not, not really. John? Uh, there are some, and they're not all in Wake County, though they mostly are. I mean, there's the, the seat that uh, Jim Fulgham was running for until he passed away. Johnny Mac Alexander is the Republican nominee against Tom Bradshaw, the former Transportation Secretary, former Raleigh Mayor, the Democratic nominee. That's a race the Democrats have a fair amount of confidence. They, have, they, they can pick that one up. Generally speaking, statewide, it looks like if the Republicans lose two, maybe three seats in the state Senate, maybe four or five seats in the House net, they'd be pretty comfortable with that. They would still have healthy majorities in both chambers. But if you get larger than that, you look at four or five Senate seats, you know, eight, nine, ten House seats, that's a night Democrats would be happy with. Well, we'll be tracking it as we get ready to go to election, for sure, no doubt. When we come back, we'll be talking about the shrinking middle class. This is NC Spin. 
and C-SPAN will return after these messages. Hi, I'm Linda Loveland. I want the best for my kids. Feeding them foods they like within my budget is a priority. But what do we really know about these foods? North Carolina farmers and food experts give you a website to find it all. FeedTheDialogueNC.com, a place where moms like you and me can learn more about the foods we eat and the farmers that feed us. Check it out. Add your input and help feed the dialogue. Let's talk food at FeedTheDialogueNC.com. The best part about being a member of a Touchstone Energy Cooperative is that it's your Touchstone Energy Cooperative. Learn more about the power of your co-op membership at TogetherWeSave.com. North Carolina's Touchstone Energy Cooperatives, looking out for you. We knew that something was wrong with Samuel. When the doctors told us autism, my heart sank. When I found out that the insurance companies were denying coverage for the therapy that Samuel needed, I couldn't believe it. Tom Tillis saw a need and he fought for it. Tom Tillis understood those challenges and, and, and was a huge advocate for us. Tom Tillis has taken the politics and big insurance to the side and tried to do the right thing for families in North Carolina. Carolina Rising is responsible for the content of this advertising. We now return to NC Spin. The shrinking middle class. On last week's show, we talked about the revenue shortfall the state is experiencing. One reason for shrinking state revenues is our strong dependence on income taxes and our decision to go from a three-tier to a single flat rate system for all wage earners. The Census Bureau reports that in 2012, one in five North Carolina taxpayers earned less than $10,500 per year. 40% earn less than $27,000 a year, while the top 20% earn more than $155,000 a year. Nate Silver's 538 blog site says the median household income has been sagged stagnant since 1988, but more importantly, the number considered themselves middle class is shrinking. Question one to John. Some say the primary reason state revenues are down is because income tax rates to upper income wage earners have been cut and the flat tax won't produce enough revenues. Do we need to reduce our dependence on income taxes? And if so, where would we get the revenue? Well, I don't think they're going to do anything more to reduce the, or change the, the percentages that we get. It's important to remember that all taxes are income taxes. Almost all taxes are paid for out of current income. They don't, not very many people pay taxes out of savings. And you know, you can't pay your property tax by chiseling bricks off your house and throwing them at the tax collector, though that might feel good. So they're all income taxes, and you can't really get away from that. You're really just determining among a class of taxpayers what is the relative burden. Now this talk about the revenue shortfall is way premature. There was some talk about this the other week that got attention, including on this show, that came to the staggering conclusion that there was a tax cut last year. They were comparing revenues collected in 2013 to revenues collected in 2014. That's not a shortfall. That was planned. Right. The difference be would be between the revenue they expected to get and the revenue they're getting. There isn't nearly enough information to draw any conclusions about that right now, or if there is one, it's a pretty small gap. So uh, the, the median household income is an important statistic not to get too confused about. The reason why economists typically prefer per capita income changes is because households change. And over the course of the last 25 years, there have been a somewhat higher number of divorces, single parent families, households are of different size. So you have to adjust for the number of people in the household before you draw conclusions about income trends. They're not good lately. They're certainly not pretty, but it isn't as bad as a statistic like that would suggest. Phil Kirk, there's a lot of discussion about the impact of incomes and, and uh, Robert Reich, the former Labor Secretary, has a pretty dramatic graph that shows income disparity, uh, disparity since the Depression all the way up to the Great Depression, and it, it looks like a, a bridge. Um, what's going on with the middle class and, and what can be done? Well, that's a, thank you for that softball question. <laughs> <laughs> I said I'd make uh, you look good tonight. You help us out here. If I had an answer to that, I'd write a book, too, like Robert Reich has written a number of books. Uh, I, I think the, the definitions uh, have changed over time. I think uh, John's made some, 
some good points. Uh, what can we do to help? Uh, obviously, growing the economy uh, generally would help everybody, uh, some more than others. So I think it, it gets back to the creation of more jobs, better jobs, uh, and that's a whole other issue. But I, I think it, it rests with, uh, with raising all tide. You know, the tide would raise everybody and have better jobs. And how to do that, I'm, I certainly don't have the answer for that. I've got some opinions. Chris, but. are we giving too much tax leniency to the upper income earners? Well, uh, I think so. I'm not sure uh, that uh, we have a lot of data that shows giving uh, somebody who makes $940,000 a year, which is the top 1%, a $12,000 a year tax break, does a lot for the uh, for the for investments. Those people have, uh, I mean, that money goes into accounts, and I don't think it goes right into investments. A couple of quick things. One is, uh, last year we saw Governor McCrory order state agencies to reduce spending by a certain percentage. Uh, I think we're going to see that again if we have any sort of shortfall. And what's frustrating about that is that that's a budget cut. We don't talk about it as a budget cut when they pass the budget. So I believe we're going to see budget cuts coming from the governor's office that will be across the board, which we won't have, we won't have discussed, which will also, I uh, think, depress state services. Cash, any silver bullets to help the middle class right now? Where? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where? Exactly. I mean, I mean uh, uh, the chairman makes an excellent point. Uh, unless we see our economy improve dramatically, which opens the door for more investments and for more uh, uh, corporations, either foreign or otherwise, moving into North Carolina and bringing jobs with them. Uh, we've gotten some good news of, of late, but, but clearly not enough. Um, unless we see those kind of things happen almost on, on, on uh, parallel tracks, uh, we're going to be stuck in this rut for, for some time. Um, and, you know, John talks about uh, uh, families changing and, and the like, divorces up and so forth. Well, one of the reasons why all that is changing is because of the economy. When the economy is rougher, then families tend to fragment. So, uh, uh, so the answer is, yeah, where is the silver bullet? I'd like to see it. Clearly something uh, that's going to impact us as we move forward. Uh, we'll be watching out for that silver bullet, the job creation and impact of taxes. We're going to find out what we don't know in our next segment. You're watching NC Spin. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. Does your North Carolina business or organization have a story to tell? I'm Richard Campbell, and at Carolina Broadcasting and Publishing, we help tell stories that connect you to the people who will respond. We take the time to understand our clients' needs and what makes them unique. We craft their stories through the efficient use of words, images, and videos that resonate with their desired audience. We also know that a good story is incomplete without a call to action. On video, on air, online, and in print, from concept to final production, no one can help tell your story more effectively or affordably than we can. For special introductory offers, visit carolinabroadcasting.com or call 919-832-1416. Again, that's carolinabroadcasting.com. Let us help tell your story today. Your family physician supports Medicaid reform. That's good for North Carolina patients, providers, and taxpayers. For over a year, we've worked with the governor and the General Assembly on a plan for responsible Medicaid reform. The Senate's proposed Medicaid changes are a departure from this plan. Changes that could lead to a decrease in the number of primary care physicians providing care in communities that need them the most. The destruction of our state's medical home network, a network that prevents unnecessary hospital and emergency room visits. And disregards the elderly, the blind, and disabled, and the health care they need. Care we're morally and legally obligated to provide. Now is not the time to disregard the progress we've made, now is the time for lawmakers to implement responsible Medicaid reform that protects and improves health care for all North Carolinians. Visit rnchealthcare.com and tell your lawmaker to support responsible Medicaid reform. Are you concerned for the future of rural North Carolina? Then join the North Carolina Rural Center and other business and government leaders for the 2014 NC Rural Assembly on October 30th at the Doubletree in Raleigh. Register online at ncruralcenter.org. 
One of the best parts of our show is when we ask our panelists to tell us something we don't know. We'll start off with Chris Fitzsimons. I think one of the bigger stories in North Carolina that has been lost among all the election discussion is uh, the apparent move by Secretary of Health and Human Services Aldona Vosch and Medicaid Director Robin Cummings uh, to, to actually recommend to Governor McCrory that we expand Medicaid in North Carolina. They're going to present, be presenting him with some options. They've been on Time Warner Cable. They went on WRL on the record, and they are pretty close to recommending uh, several, one of several ways to expand Medicaid. I don't know whether the legislature will do it, but I think it'll be a big issue in 2015. Phil Kirk. I'm going to go way out on a limb and predict the winner of the U.S. Senate race. All right. Everybody listening? <laughs> we are. We're tuned in. Based on anecdotal uh, evidence uh, and polling, and that means I've talked to two or three people, <laughs> um, the first candidate for U.S. Senate that comes out with an ad and says, I am for this, I am for that, and says the things he or she's for, is going to win. John. We referenced 538 website earlier. They just did a ranking of all the pollsters in the country. What's the top ranked pollster in reliability in North Carolina? Is it public policy polling? Is it Civitas's contractors? No, it's Elon University, the top ranked pollster in reliability in North Carolina. During the presidential Cash. elections of 2008 and uh, 2012, black female Democrats have led the way of all groups in terms of early voting. Uh, for this year, if we look at the early voting numbers and we don't see black female Democrats leading the way, Democrats are in trouble on November 4th. You heard our spin on the issues of the day. To stay informed all during the week or give us feedback and read Tom's weekly column, visit our website at ncspin.com. We hope you'll join us next week when NC Spin will take on more issues of interest to the people of North Carolina. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.